Yeah, thank you. So again, I'm Carl, and I'm at the University of Colorado and in the U.S. And I mentioned before, I'm also the president of the International UV Association, one of the co-sponsors of the meeting. My talk today is uh, one that I actually made up for this, this talk. I didn't use it in a class like Mike, but uh, I had the same talk, which is good. Um, to talk about kind of what does the landscape of UV look like? What does UV system look like? And I think it will help you put into perspective, you know, the, the next few, uh, the rest of the talks this, this morning and this afternoon. Um, because there's a lot of systems out there. I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly because some of them, you know, you wonder how they could possibly work. Some of them look strange. Some of them are very effective. But there's so many systems out there that are possible to look at. I thought it would be good to take a, a look at the landscape of those systems um, and get a feel for um, what's out there. So first I'll give you an overview of the point of view systems. I'll go through that quickly. We've seen some of that earlier. Um, then I'll talk about two different types of UV systems, a point of entry UV, kind of where the you know, UV coming maybe into uh, a, a building or a small community. And then there's a point of use UV system, which is actually the household user or the personal user using UV directly. Then I'll talk about issues around monitoring of UV systems uh, to make sure they're operating well and the sustainability issues around um, UV compared to other technologies. So Maggie talked about this a little bit. We heard about these statistics about you know, the hundreds of millions of people who don't have access to improved water sources. Um, and then Anna Maria mentioned, you know, this not just about getting improved water sources, but is that improved water source actually of good quality? And we're only now realizing that achieving Millennium Development Goals of getting access to improved water sources may not be that, you know, telling in terms of the, 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 the public health impacts. We really want to know that people have access to water quality that's safe to drink because there's two, those are two different things. And we're only now really collecting data on that through the, the WHO and UNICEF programs. Uh, looking at monitoring of water quality. So I think we'll learn more and more about that, but that brings in the, into importance, even if you have an improved water source, you still probably should have some type of disinfection process that you use to help ensure the safe water. Um, so there's community systems, uh, point of view systems, and there's so many different options. And just to run through a few of those, uh, boiling we heard before, um, we've heard about ceramic, membrane, ceramic water filters, and there's also membrane filters. Uh, Biosand we've heard about a little bit earlier as well. These are all sand filtration mechanisms that also have a biological process that helps to destroy and kind of um, treat the water from a microbiological perspective. Chlorine obviously works as well as a disinfectant, but it adds a taste and an odor that some people find you know, displeasing and they actually won't drink the water if it has chlorine in it. And that's a big challenge in looking at what kind of behavior change we need to help promote, to help adopt some of these technologies. And that's one area I think UV has a little bit of an advantage in, is that it doesn't cause any taste problems, it doesn't change the taste of the water. So people might be more amenable to using a UV treated water versus something that has a, the taste or smell of chlorine in it if they're not used to that. Some people love the taste of chlorine in the US and if it doesn't smell and taste like chlorine, they don't want to drink the water because they don't think it's safe. So that's the opposite side, but they've grown up with that. Um, SOTUS is solar based disinfection. We're fortunate to have two of the world's leading experts in looking at solar based processes um, for disinfection, and we'll hear a lot about that. SOTUS is the short term for that, solar disinfection. There's been a lot of research on that. But that's different from UV, engineered UV systems, where we're talking about different wavelengths of importance. Solar wavelengths are more sunlight emitted onto the Earth's surface, which is above 300 nanometers. And UV disinfection, in an engineered sense, is wavelengths below 300 nanometers, around 260, 250, as Mike showed you before, as being the important one. So there's different mechanisms there. So we'll focus on UV treatment here, obviously. Um, here's just some of the advantages and disadvantages of different processes. So we have chlorine, it's really commonly used, but you know, it does leave a residual disinfection, which is important. But it also you know, has some taste and odor issues. It forms byproducts, you know, which we don't really consider now because we're thinking about the immediate needs of preventing diarrheal diseases. The long-term potential that you might get cancer and, you know, by the time you're 60 or 70 is probably less important when you're two years old and you want to make sure you don't get diarrhea. So that's an issue that's important, but we need to pay more attention to it, I think, in the future. Biosand filtration is also a, it's a process that doesn't add anything to the water. You're, you're filtering the water. We're using a biological-based process, the slow sand filtration. It fo forms a biological layer that helps to remove particles and remove um, pathogens through processes like predation and other you know, complex uh, 
microbial uh, interactions. It's a slow process, though. You have to wait some time. You have to make sure your, your, your system is, is operating well, and it's all already up to, uh, you know, uh, clear, clear operational standards. It doesn't leave a residual as well, so you have to use the water pretty much right away unless you um, have a means to provide a residual for storage. Ceramic water filters also don't use chemicals. Again, it doesn't change the taste, uh, potentially using local materials, so that's a benefit. It's a slow process as well. Sometimes you have to wait. You know, the flow rate through the filters is quite slow. Um, and then it doesn't also, also doesn't leave, leave a residual. Uh, and the re removal mechanisms are, are not so good, perhaps, for viruses in some cases. Boiling water works very well, but it uses quite a bit of energy. It's often not practical, and it can cause some indoor air pollution issues. SOTUS, I mentioned solar disinfection, uses sunlight. So uh, this is a slow process. It might take a number of hours, and you have to have good conditions for it to work well. And UV doesn't use chemicals as well. It's a fast process. It's effective against uh, viruses and, and spores and, and protozoans and things as you heard. The doses vary. Um, it also doesn't leave residuals. So that's one, one uh, detriment about UV. That just gives you a little bit of landscape of the point of use options, and we're going to focus now on, on applications of UV. And I want to look at two different applications, um, <coughs> which I think are important, and potentials for UV technology to grow, especially in developing communities. We know that urban areas are growing rapidly, and many of these areas have piped water supplies, but the quality of that water supply is sometimes in question. And a lot of um, you know, emerging economies are having people who are now concerned about that, and they might want to have some type of treatment process at their home tap. And even you know, in the U.S., where we have perfectly good quality water, meets all federal regulations, so many people in their homes are using some type of household water treatment, which sometimes makes the water quality worse if they don't maintain the system, but hopefully it makes it better. It might remove some taste. It might have an, an added disinfection. It might use reverse osmosis membranes, which is a completely overkill. But people have this image that they have to do something else, even in our country where we have perfectly safe drinking water. Um, so in developing communities where you have a piped source because of the infrastructure, because of the distribution system, that it may not be up to speed as far as you know leakage and things like that, you might want to have another process at the home to make sure um, your water is safe. And I know when I travel all over the world, I like to bring my own disinfection system with me just in case I have to drink water that might be of concern to me in terms of microbiological quality. And I'll show you the type of system I bring with me. It's actually a UV handheld unit. But you can use these things as, um, you know, Coming into a building and coming into a household, uh, UV can be used in an urban setting. We heard the situation about rural settings, much more dire in terms of the availability of, of safe drinking water. Um, in these si situations, you often are bringing water from a, a source. You might have to walk miles to that source. That source is usually of poor quality, potentially. It might look clear, but it might have microbial uh, pollution in it. You may need to add a filtration process. Um, this may be something where you can bring it and then we can use it for a rural community and everyone in the community can use it or it might be at the household level as well. So I think UV has a number of areas that it could fit into both in the urban and rural settings and hopefully we'll be able to touch on those today. So what do UV systems look like? I'm going to review the point of entry systems um, for small communities and for this I mean uh, systems that serve a community, uh, that serve multiple households. Also review personal user systems. Um, such as this system right here, which is a SteriPen. This is the one I bring with me when I travel and also when I go hiking and things in the, in the, the mountains. It's easy to disinfect. I'll see, talk to you about how that works. Um, and then we'll touch on how sustainable these systems are and, and what, what's their effectiveness. So first, uh, point of entry systems. And basically what I did here is I, I scavenged the Internet, you know, looked around. What's, what are people selling? Try to get the cost. What's out there? Look on Amazon.com even. I mean, you can look on places to find UV systems. Um, and here's pretty much what I came up with and also from my experiences in working in the field. First of all, I'll talk to you about something that's not on Amazon.com. It's actually a system that uh, students at my university worked on. Um, it's, it's called Bring Your Own Water. And this is in Rwanda, a project that we had. And it came out of an Engineers Without Borders type of process, but it turned into a little bit bigger thing than that. Um, mainly, this one system is a UV-based system. And you see the UV system right here in this box, the silver box. But it com it's combined with filtration system. And it's right now it's operating in an orphanage in Rwanda, um, although Rwanda's closing down all their orphanages, so this will soon be available for other uses. 
Um, the cost is not so clear because it was built, but the system basically um, is centered around this tower, which is basically a water tank tower, and, and kids have to go collect water at a spring source and bring jug by jug up, and they pour the water in the top up here, and they walk up these stairs. See down on the lower left, they walk up these stairs to the top, and then it goes through a filtration system, basically a roughing filter, which is indicated up here. It's up top, and then a sand filter, and then it goes into this UV disinfection unit. So the, as you pour water in, it displaces water and pushes through the UV unit. The UV unit is powered by a solar panel, a small solar panel, which is about this big. And it powers a, a small lamp, which is you know, about a 15-watt lamp. And here's the power supply that's inside one of, the ho uh, one of the homes there where the kids live. And this is the UV system, and it's sealed up, and basically get water out of this tap and collect it, and then they can use the water for, for drinking and take it back for use or drink it immediately from that point. So this is kind of a homemade bring your own water system that a bunch of students designed that's operational, but it requires regular maintenance and checkup. If, if they just walked away and never came back, the system wouldn't be working again. And ha it actually happened in one of the places they put it in. Two years later, it wasn't being used. The system actually spurred a business that started with a, a group called Mana Energy, and they actually figured out a way through um, convincing authorities that they're by using UV, they're offsetting the use of boiling water and burning wood for boiling that water. So they're actually financing this based on a carbon credit market approach. Um, and this is a similar system, this box system, and, but now it's put in with these two uh, filters that are ahead of it. And the dose is about 40 millijoules, which Mike mentioned before is about the standard dose for, for an activation in most organisms. Um, and the flow rate's between 1 to 15 gallons per minute. So that's the system that, that um, MANA has put in, and, and they've put these into group homes and schools and things like that mostly around um, in Rwanda. And the system basically looks like this. It's, it's two water filters f followed by disinfection. And the UV units, th one of the innovations they came up with, and these are all solar-powered UV systems, is to have a very small UV unit that was always on, just drawing like maybe four watts of power, a really small UV lamp. So you see inside, this is what's inside the UV box. So there's two UV systems. One's here, you can draw here, so one's here. Um, and then one's here, right here. And these two systems, um, depending upon the flow rate that is needed, they, one might be on only or both might be on. So this one can treat about you know, a flow rate of, of two to five gallons per minute, and this one can go up to 15 gallons per minute. So you can optimize your power use and your, your solar panel use um, through running these systems. And there's a bunch of controls in here that look at flow, and they actually built another box that has a UV transmittance monitor as well. This gets a little bit more expensive as you put these things together, but when you think about a community water system that um, can be operated remotely, and this all has telemetry, so you can, you know, a cell phone of someone who's working in the field can get an indicator that the UV lamp light is low or that the transmittance is low, and, and you can get an indication when the lamp's out and when it needs some maintenance. So these UV systems really lend themselves to monitoring like that because they're all electronically based, so um, they could send a signal to, to a cell phone that, you know, it's in need of, of of some repair or some maintenance. So let's get into some other systems commercial. You hear about this one later. This is uh, NEDAP is here. They have a system out in the, you know, they'll talk to you about the system out, out, outside of the, of the venue here. Um, but this is also a, like kind of a community-based system, and, and you'll hear more about this later, so I don't want to touch on it too much. Uh, but it does have a good flow rate, good lifespan, uh, uses a UV lamp that you heard from Mike, the low-pressure UV lamp system, and it's also solar-powered. And here's an idea of the cost uh, for a community, about $3,500 for this one. Maybe you'll hear some updates on that. This is all stuff, again, I got off the Internet. Aquapure is another company I saw. Didn't get that much information about the similar cost of $3,500 U.S. dollars. Most of the costs here will be in U.S. dollars, I'll show you. Flow rates, they say between 30 and 100 gallons per minute. They didn't have any information on the monitoring system, the UV lamp type that they use. I assume it's a low-pressure lamp or the UV dose, but this is a similar type of kiosk-type system that you might see. These are all you know, systems that will be useful on a community scale or on a house uh, uh, building-type scale. This system is by Pentec, um, smaller flow rate, about two gallons per minute, and this has a, a filter as well here, but typically the UV lamp might be in the bottom, you know, it might, might be you know, here in the system, the water's flowing through it around the lamp and coming out. And this is just, again, a low-pressure UV lamp, and the dose is about 16 millijoules per square centimeter. 
And this UV dose came from old regulations in the U.S. from the pu public health um, authorities that suggested this dose would be good enough for bacterial inactivation for, for a lot of uh, viruses as well. And that dose is used in some cases in, in some systems and uh, certainly good enough for, for, you know, four or five log inactivation of bacteria. The cost of this is quite a bit lower. It's about two to $300, two to $500. Um, and you can, you know, find this as well. I'll talk a little bit about these light in a pipe system for stainless steel pipes. Um, this one is by High Tech Ultraviolet. It has a var varying systems, either with one lamp in it or multiple lamps. So it can go up to 50,000 liters per minute. Um, they also use a low pressure lamp output. And you saw that output at 185 nanometers. They encourage that output in this system. Um, the dose is at, you know, using a light at 23.7, which is the low pressure output. And the doses there probably also range from, depending upon the flow rate, um, could range from, you know, 10 to 40 millijoules per centimeter squared. This system um, was developed at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab in, in California, and it's a UV system. It's made by UV Waterworks. You notice here, that this is one that's a little bit different than the other ones. This has a light that's above the water, so the water's flowing in this tray right here. So it flows in one end and flows out the other. And this light is right here. This is the UV lamp. It looks blue because one of the emission lines is, is in blue light. But the light actually comes down and it, it penetrates into the water and a very thin film of water flows underneath this. And it achieves a flow rate of about 15 liters per minute in this kind of trough. And the trough is also lined with a UV reflective material, aluminum, that reflects the UV light back up into the water as well. After it penetrates through, it gets to go back again. The dose here is designed around 40 millijoules, as you'll see this common dose for an activation of, of most pathogens of concern. And this can serve a community of about 1,000 people, it's said to, said to serve. It uses about 50 watts of power and it requires maintenance as well. So this one, instead of a light in a pipe where the lamp is actually submerged in water, which is most of the systems have, the lamps are in the water, which you hear about, you shouldn't really mix electricity and water, but the way they design the systems, the electricity is separate, just the light gets in the water. In this case, the light is above the water and this has some advantages, which you'll hear about a little bit later um, in some other systems we talk about. There's a lot of, a lot of manufacturers that have um, UV lights in a pipe, basically. And it looks something like this, where the lamp is just in here, like that. And the water would flow in, come around the lamp, and then come out the end. So the idea is to create good hydraulics so you get good exposure of the water and the pathogens in the water to the UV light. We mentioned it only takes a few seconds of exposure time. Remember, the photons emitted from that lamp are traveling at the speed of light, which is very fast. Um, so they'll get through the water very quickly in a split second, and they'll be able to, to affect the microorganisms and cause disinfection. And there's a lot of corporations here that are producing systems like this. They look differently. They have all different sizes. It's different flow rates, so small flow rate up to a very large flow rate. And you can imagine there's a lot of companies out there that have systems. And these all need electricity to run. They, they need flow rate. Um, they usually have monitors on them for is the lamp on or off. Uh, that might be all the monitoring they have, but they might have a monitor like that. They might have a UV transmittance monitor. They might have a UV intensity sensor as well. So let's look at some of the smaller systems. You'll hear about this system a little bit more in a talk this afternoon. Uh, but this is uh, the UV tube system developed also by a group at UC Berkeley and basically has a lamp here in this pipe that's in, in the bucket that holds the water and the water flows through and flows through the UV system. This is also, I mentioned, um, the light here is out of the water. So you'll see the cross section, the water's here, the lamp's above it, and the light's coming in the water that way, and you can see a cross-sectional uh, here how that looks. This also achieves a fairly high dose, about 90 millijoules. you hear more about this later, but it can achieve high levels of virus inactivation. Um, and this is all made with local materials. Um, households, you can, you can build this or you can get it built for you, but it's quite an inexpensive system as well, about 34 U.S. dollars. Another system that was uh, out in the, in the world a couple years ago, and I think they've developed this a little bit further into the next one I'll show you, but this is called the UV bucket, and basically has a three-tiered system where they put the water in here, the water goes through the UV as it travels through the second stage of the bucket, the UV lamp is right here, 
and this is a small UV lamp, might be four to nine watts, so small power, and then it comes into this collection bucket, and then you can take water out of your spout um, when you're ready to drink it, and it has a, a, a safe collection, safe storage, because it's all sealed up and you won't get your hands in there. This also achieves fairly high doses, about 80 to 90 millijoules per centimeter squared, very high inactivation of bacteria and viruses, and they're also validated systems. It's also fairly inexpensive. And this is the system now that this group has put out since then. Um, you can see it has a filter system here, which is in the bucket. You see the water's in this bucket here, and it comes through this filter. And then the UV lamp is actually a very small light in the spout there. And the, all you need to disinfect the water is to have the water flow out of that tap at, a very, at the flow rate. It might be you know, a couple milliliters you know, per second or so. But it's slow enough that you achieve disinfection. You know, they get high removals of you know, four log inactivation of, of parasites and bacteria, long lamp. And it's um, a low pressure light source. It's a very small light source. And you get one and a half liters per minute flow rate out of this. So that's fairly reasonable for, you know, if you want to fill up a glass of water and drink it right away, it's perfect. You know, it's all, it's all set up there. You don't have to wait 30 minutes or 60 minutes for the disinfectant to react. And you can look at all these systems. The websites are listed on the slides as well. Um, India has quite a few UV systems that are being used. This is one's called the UV water box. And this has basically water coming in from a tank, has some, a couple of filters here. And then a UV system right here, very small uh, UV system, and then a tap to collect the water. Flow rate of this is about seven liters per minute. Uses a low pressure lamp. The lamps you see, the hours of lamps. There's about 8,000 hours um, per, in, in a year, so you can think about how long these last. About a year long, 10,000 hours kills over two log viruses and bacteria. This also uses a solar panel. And this whole system is about 3,000 to 4,000 dollars U.S. dollars. On your household scale, um, about two liters per minute. Uh, there's a lot of systems that combine filtration and UV. On a small scale, this, this you can collect water here, and this just tells you the lamp's on or off. This has a dose of about 30 millijoules at a UV transmittance of 90%. If you have better UV transmittance, you get higher doses. Uh, this is just you know, fill up your cup, drink the water. It's on, it could be on your counter on, in your kitchen, about a cost of 100 US dollars. Uh, you'll see a little bit more about this system. This is the UV Pearl. You'll actually, there's actually one of these out on display outside, so take a look at that. This is a new UV technology using light-emitting diodes, UV LED lamps. The cost I hear is in the quite high range, tens of ten thousand dollars and more, because of the technology is fairly young and the UV lights are, are quite expensive now, but they're coming down in price. But this system is uses no mercury. It doesn't use mercury lamps like the other ones do. It has LED lamps. And the LED lamps are emitting about 275 nanometers, so still close to that germicidal range. And then they estimate a lifetime of about 60,000 gallons of treatment. And this is right now used for kind of high-tech industrial purposes that they want to make sure they don't have any mercury potential in the water. You know, if the, if, the, if the whole system blew up and the lamps broke or something, they'd ruin their whole batch of industrial chemicals, and that would be a big, big concern. But in our case, you know, um, it's very, very rare that that would ever happen. And you know, it's much cheaper to go with a typical fluorescent type lamp than it is to go with one of these LEDs. Although I think in a number of years we'll see LEDs being one of the main uses, the main suppliers of UV systems. Also on the household scale, on your on your kitchen cat, uh, counter, you might have one of these about a hundred dollars, taking water from your tap. Flow rate is you know less than one liter per minute. Small UV lamp, 11 watts. Lamp life, they say about 3,000 3, liters, and then you replace the system. Similar system as well. This is all kind of from similar technology, similar, um, just different product lines. About 10 liters per hour. Um, has just a monitor on it, just a little bit of a LED, LED outputs there for monitoring. They say this lamp life is about 800 hours, but it's probably quite a bit longer than that. This is also a small system. Fill up the reservoir here, get the water out your cup in there and, and get your water um, and the system as well fills up here. These are just household base units, about 15 liters per hour. Another system, you can see the UV light in here, this would be the, the water would get treated, it will come into the system, run through here and then come out this tap and you put your cup here and drink your water. 
and this is like you might, you, you might have on your household in, in, on your counter for clean water applications uh, to give you disinfected water about one to two liters per minute. I mentioned the SteriPen. This is a fairly new product. It's been out for a few years. It's quite getting quite popular in the U.S. among people who want to bring a, a, a portable disinfection unit with them when they travel or when they go uh, hiking or backpacking and they want to drink water out of a stream that might be contaminated with Giardia or Cryptosporidium or viruses. Basically, the system is, is you take a bottle of water and you, you, know, you might have a, a plastic water bottle you bring with you and you fill it up with a liter of water and you stick this uh, pen in it, turn it on, and you stir the pen for about 30 seconds. And by stirring the pen, you stir up the water and you get the water to come close to the UV light and it disinfects your water. And it's definitely overdosing of what you need in 30 seconds of exposure, but because you want to make sure all the water gets exposed, you have the stirring motion. Um, here's another one where the, the pen's up in the bottom here and you stir it using this, this crank here. And this is um, one of the indicators you have. You know, if, if you did a good job, it'll give a smiley face. If you didn't do a good job, it'll be a frown and you have to do it again. Press the button and, and do it again. Uh, but this provides you a very high dose of UV and it's about, you can buy it in a, in a an outdoor store for 50 US dollars to 100 US dollars, depending upon what type you have. They have ones, these all are battery operated, just AA batteries, or you can get other types of batteries. They also have solar powered ones that have a rechargeable battery. And another system that came out also, it's um, made by a company called Camelback, and it's the same thing. We have a water bottle here. This is your water bottle. You fill it up, you put the cap on. Inside the cap, there's a UV light right here. And you you press on the top button here, this is the button that's on top of the, on the cap, and then you, as the light comes on, you just, you just rotate the bottle slowly like this, and you mix the water up, and the water is mixing through here, and eventually all of it gets exposed to UV, and you get disinfection as well. So this is a similar thing where you fill up your water bottle and, and have your disinfected water. And these are all good for portable, personal use um, UV systems. So you get the extreme from you know, household community-based system to a personal use one where you just have your one liter of water that you, you're disinfected. So that's kind of what I found when I looked for what is out there in the UV world. And I think it's, it's interesting to look on the internet, see what you could find. Um, there's a lot of systems out there. I mean, there's literally hundreds of different suppliers and hundreds of different systems that are possible. Um, some of the things I noticed as I was looking through them is, you know, what kind of monitoring do they use? What kind of flow rates can you treat? What kind of what do they say about the system? What kind of lamp do they use? Most of them have some type of monitor that says, is the UV lamp on or is it off? And that's it's just the basic one you want to know. You know. Is the light on? Is it working? Because you know, unlike chlorine, you can't measure, measure a residual of UV light. You have to actually see the lamp on or have an indication that it's on. And if it is on, hopefully it's working well enough. And you might have even a UV sensor that tells you what the intensity of light is. But that's kind of rare that you'd see in these systems, an actual UV intensity sensor. But ideally, you'd have one of those. Ideally, you'd have a sensor that told you about the UV transmittance of the water, so it's changing over time. Ideally, also, you'd know the flow rate of the water, so you make sure you're delivering the dose. But most systems are designed to be fairly fail-safe in that they only let a certain flow through, and they have an indicator that the lamp is on, and they design the system for the end of lamp life. And if you follow the maintenance schedule by replacing the lamp at the intervals re requested, such as once a year or once every 10,000 hours of use, then they're pretty much fail safe to use as long as the lamp, you know the lamp is on and you're having electricity to the system or you have your solar system working. Um, other things you might want to have is, you know, the, the, the pressure of water through there. Um, you might want to have a system that is able to provide telemetry or remote operation or remote indication of the system being on. And you can imagine like this system here is, this is the guts of one of the advanced systems I showed you before with that, they have two UV systems. Um, this one's a smaller, this one's a larger. It has a UV transmittance monitor in here, and this is a just basic electronic controls that some students d designed to transmit the, the power between the two lamps systems to operate based on flow rate. So you turn one, one turns on when the flow rate gets a little bit higher, and here's a flow meter. We'll kick on the second UV system and then open a valve so that the other system will work. And this is all you can all get inf you can get information on this whole system on a cell phone. So you can have one maintenance worker that takes care of a number of villages that have these systems in, in place, and they can get a, a text message when, okay, check out this system in this village, go there, the lamp's out, or there's a problem, or there's a flow rate too high, or the UV transmittance changed. So you can see a lot of potential advantages of using UV and having this kind of approach 
um, that would help with monitoring, would help with uh, evaluation of the system uh, for maintenance purposes. So what makes a good UV device? I mean, one of the most important things is, is the UV system certified? Is it validated? Because some systems aren't actually validated, and you have to make sure they are validated. Did they test microorganisms through the system? Did they test viruses? Did they test bacteria? And it should come with some kind of certification, either certification from a, a, a national body, like in the U.S. we have the National Sanitation a Foundation that certifies systems, or based on some protocol that's internationally accepted. There's protocols in Europe and other places that are interna internationally accepted for UV disinfection testing. Does it have a monitoring system? I think you need to have a monitoring system, at least this lamp on or off. Can you remotely operate it would be a really good thing for a UV device. Is it easy to change the lamp, to change out the lamp to make sure uh, your, all your systems are working properly and you, could, you can uh, fix it when needed and the parts are available? Are the materials locally available? Do you have to you know, go to Amazon and get a delivery into some remote area you're, you're working in? Or are they available locally at the hardware store in the city or near, in the nearest urban area that you can get your hands on to? Uh, one of the concerns and challenges with the UV is it does require an energy source. You know, it's not free. You can't just run it. Um, when you look at any disinfection technology, there's always some energy embedded into developing that technology, whether it's you know, chlorine or a, or a ceramic water filter. You need energy to create these things. UV needs energy to run. Uh, you could run it off solar panel, that's a possibility, and you could run it using low energy source as well. Make sure your UV is germicidal UV. You saw the different ranges of UV light up to 400 nanometers. Some of them aren't very germicidal, so some systems that say they're UV may not be actual UV that cause good, good disinfection. And then, of course, UV being an on-demand water source means there's no storage required, but that's also a challenge if you need to store your water, you have to make sure it's a safe storage device and you may want to add a residual disinfectant to that system. But it does have on-demand water capability, pretty much a few seconds of treatment and you're, and you're ready to drink, drink the water. So that's one of the advantages. And the last thing I want to just mention is sustainability issues. So UV does use mercury-based lamps and uh, had some discussions last night about this. I mean, there's mercury-based lamps in our society all over the place now. Every you know, compact fluorescent lights, fluorescent lights here, these tube lamps up here, they're all mercury-based. Um, so mercury disposal is an issue and a concern, but the number of UV lamps are used that are used in disinfection are pretty much minuscule compared to the lighting that's used. And you know, ideally, you want to think about it in terms of sustainability, but it's an issue that's out there for many systems. Um, the lamps can be fragile. They can break um, if you don't treat them right. Uh, efficiency of UV systems, the low-pressure systems are about 30 to 40 percent efficient from an energy standpoint. Uh, they last about a year, and think about the replacement of those. Um, some systems may need some warm-up time requirements, so the lamp comes on, you may, might need to wait 30 seconds before you can actually run the system, unless it's on the whole time. And then you saw the issue about lamp fouling, that that needs to be uh, thought about if you have water that's uh, concerning and has a lot of foulants in it. And then you'll hear more about LEDs, I won't talk about those, but LEDs are in our future, so they're non-mercury-based lamps. Um, they're low power, but they're potentially long-lasting. So visible LEDs can last up to 10 years, and you can imagine if you had a UV system that lasts for 10 years and you don't have to change the lamp, that could be a really good advance for the, for the industry and for the technology. So in summary, I always think of UV, I always talk about it, it's kind of like a sexy technology. You know, it's got this high-tech feel, there's lights, there's photons, you can use big words and impress your friends talking about it. Um, it's got this technology factor I think a lot of people are interested in. And, whether or not you know, someone in a, in a village in, in the Amazon in Peru will care about that, I don't know. But you know, we all like our cell phones, we all like our new things, and UV has that feel to it. So I think it has a slight advantage over something like chlorine or a filter, filtration system. It's got no taste and odor issues, which I think is a big benefit. Uh, no chemicals are used. It's low energy compared to, say, boiling. Um, and the technology is validated in many cases, and you need to use a validated system. The disadvantage is obviously you need an energy source the bulbs that you use for UV lights may not be available locally. Um, there may need some additional treatment, some uh, filtration, perhaps if you have a turbid water issue of mercury, you want to be careful with your lamps and make sure you dispose of them properly. Um, and then make sure your system is validated. That can be a disadvantage if it's not validated. But hopefully with this, this overview, you can uh, get a good feel for, for UV systems, what's out there, what might be interesting for you, different applications, and then set us up for um, some of our discussions later on. So thank you for your attention. I'll have to take any questions. Yeah, Wolfgang. Okay.
Yeah, most most of the flow through systems are all have have um, some metal or some type of uh, non reactive surface. But certainly for the handhold systems, that's a possibility. I don't know who's. I know that all the all the containers are BPA free. <laughs> So, but whether or not after the UV exposure, there may be some. Do you think you can move the open surface like the digital most like the container? Yeah, and certainly you want to get away from using PVC right. pipe because um, yeah. that would degrade the pipe and it could actually, you know, harm the water quality. So that's a good point. Typically, the, the plastics don't emit light lower than 300 nanometers. So the UV light would usually be above 300 nanometers. So you see the blue light coming through, but there shouldn't be much UV. But I'll go test that in my lab when I get back home. <laughs> That's a good good point. Other questions? Yeah. It just measures the time that the light was on in the water. So make sure you had enough exposure. It would it would still think you did a good job. There may be one that has a motion sensor that makes sure you're moving it for thirty minutes, thirty seconds. That would be better. Maybe they have that. I don't know if that's one part of it. I'll take one more question. If there's yeah, right here. Yeah, which ones are certified? I think. Most of them claim to be certified in some way. So whether or not the certification is robust enough is another question, but that needs to be international certification should be should be really standardized here. And it's up to really the group of people putting the technology in, the NGO or the engineer, to pick a system responsibly. Um, but a lot of these systems you buy off the shelf if it's your household. And they, they should be certified through some international association, but that's not always the case. That's a good point. All right, well, that's my talk, so thanks again, and we'll have the next speaker come up. Um, we have, yeah. Oh, if, you want, if you want to do that. Or, okay. Is lunch ready now? Okay, good. Yeah, it is time for lunch, so actually, suggestion is we'll... Okay, so I think what we'll do is have a 45-minute break now for lunch, and we'll come back at 1.15. We'll try to gather everybody up at 1.10 to get in here. And uh, tomorrow I'll talk to us after lunch. So thanks for the morning, everybody. I want to thank all the speakers this morning as well. And um, lunch is where? Outside? Uh, okay, just out the door. And remember, visit our vendors, visit the booths, and see firsthand some of the UV systems.